This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. This is Elliot Reed. Welcome to two more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Tom Conway and Nigel Bruce. We've all heard about such famous fictional characters as, for example, Batman and Robin, Rocky, Dick Tracy, Tarzan, Captain Kirk, and Spock. Of course, standing separate from all the others are Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Their image has lasted for well over a hundred years and is still going strong as each story, film, and play about the great detective and his faithful companion carry both of them down through the years. Most of us know that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle created Sherlock Holmes in 1887, but very few have heard the name of Edith Miser. Edith who? Edith Miser. It was Edith Miser who brought Sherlock Holmes into the 20th century through that fascinating medium dramatic radio. I'd like to tell you a little about this talented woman. She was born May 9th, 1898, into a comfortable middle-class family. Radio didn't exist then, and certainly not television. But there was the theater and books. Thousands of books, and Edith read as many as she could her imagination taking flight with each classic tale by Dickens, Defoe, Hugo, and others. And then she discovered Sherlock Holmes. Totally fascinated by the great detective, she read every story that existed and every new story that arrived. Somehow, Edith Miser knew she was connected to the great detective. With the support of her parents, Edith was able to gain an impressive education both here and abroad. When she returned to America, she graduated from Vassar in 1921. By now, she had been smitten with, and subsequently went into, acting. Her bright and cheery attitude, coupled with an intense drive to succeed, landed her acting jobs in small towns until her smashing Broadway debut in 1923. When I acted on Broadway, Edith Miser was already the talk of the Broadway acting community. Though I was not a personal friend of hers, I knew of her, for she had already established herself as an actress, a singer, and a playwright. You might say that Edith Miser could have been called the Orson Welles of the late 20s. By 1926, RCA had established the NBC radio network. Edith had an idea in the back of her head she simply could not get rid of. What if Sherlock Holmes could be placed on network radio as a dramatic presentation, as a play, or perhaps a, a weekly series? In 1927, she met and married Tom McKnight. His abilities as a producer, director of plays, equaled her ability as a writer. Together, they forged an idea on how to present Sherlock Holmes on the air. They approached NBC with this concept, but the executives of the network balked at the idea. Present Sherlock Holmes on radio? A drama? Who would want to take the time to listen to such a thing? Wasn't it enough that the airways were filled with music, songs, weather reports, and some sporting events? Edith persisted and offered to meet with her friend William Gillette, whose brilliant stage performances in that role had made him the most famous Sherlock Holmes of that time. Though still skeptical, the network was now interested, and Gillette was only too glad to perform his favorite role on radio. And so, in 1930, after months of effort, Edith Miser brought Sherlock Holmes to radio. Not only that, she was the driving force in changing the face of radio. For her Sherlock Holmes presentation was the first major network dramatic radio show, and it captured the imagination of the American public. 
I'll return later with more on Edith Miser. But first, let's listen to Tom Conway and Nigel Bruce in the Sherlock Holmes adventure, The Strange Case of Professor Presbury or the Creeping Man. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Here we are once more in Dr. Watson's firelit study. The wind is howling outside, but inside the heavy red curtains have been drawn across the windows. And the only sound we can hear is the cheerful crackling of the logs in the fireplace. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. You don't know how lucky you are that you don't have to go out on a night like this. Yes, it's one of the advantages of having retired from active medical practice. You know the old adage, man works from sun to sun, but woman's work's never done. The base libel, as far as doctors are concerned. You never know when Mr. Smith is going to acquire a black eye or Mrs. McTavish may decide to present her an addition to the clan. <laughs> <laughs> never a dull moment, eh, Dr. Watson? Oh, dear me, no. That's one thing I've never complained of. If it wasn't a patient who disturbed what little routine I had, it was Sherlock Holmes. I remember one bitter February evening. It was the second winter after my marriage. I just settled down to my after-dinner pipe when the doorbell rang. It was a note from Holmes. It said, come at once if convenient. If inconvenient, come all the same. And you went, of course. Now, Mr. Bell, you'll hear all about that in good time. But uh, haven't you something to tell our listeners? Yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Men, attractive, well-groomed hair does a great deal to give a man self-assurance, to say nothing of helping his appearance. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing more about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite among America's most successful men. It's called Cremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which has never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Cremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer. Keeps every hair in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kreml never gives hair that greasy, patent leather look. Kreml keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet it always feels and looks clean on your hair and scalp. No other hair tonic keeps hair more handsomely groomed, yet it never looks greasy. So men, for better groomed hair, change to Kreml. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, when you received the mysterious message from Sherlock Holmes... You at once went round to Baker Street, I suppose. Yes, curiosity has always been my Achilles' heel. Well, when I arrived at Baker Street, I found Holmes huddled in his armchair, his knees drawn up, and his pipe in his mouth. He was sunk in a profound reverie. And I'd been in the room several moments before he became aware of my existence. Oh, so there you are, Watson. There you are. Obviously. I've been here for seven minutes, as a matter of fact. Unimportant, completely unimportant, and uninteresting. Watson, have you ever speculated on the importance of a knowledge of dogs in detective work? Dogs? Well, naturally. Bloodhounds, sleuthhounds... No, no, uh... I'm not interested in that phase of the subject. It's too obvious. There is another side, far more subtle. I suppose there is, but I'm just where I know... Do you the... recollect in the case you so sensationally wrote up as the adventure of the Copper Beaches? Yes, but the case was sensational. In that instance, it wasn't the dog. It was the fact that the master of the house was willing to pay a sizable sum to... Don't prattle, Watson, don't prattle. Prattle? I was about to point a moral. In the case of the Copper Beaches, I was able, by noting the actions of a rather vicious child, to draw some startling deductions as to the criminal instincts of its father, who was considered a thoroughly respectable citizen. Oh, of course, yes, I remember, but uh, what's that got to do with... My the... line of thought about dogs is analogous. Whoever saw a frisky dog in a gloomy family... Or a sad dog and a happy one. Snarling people have snarling dogs. Dangerous people have dangerous dogs. Surely, Holmes, you didn't write me out on a night like this to discuss the temperaments of dogs? Not in general, no. What interests me is why Professor Presbury's faithful wolfhound, Roy, endeavors to bite him. You mean Professor Presbury, the famous Camford's physiologist? Quite. The dog, until recently a most devoted animal has attacked his master twice. Huh? What do you make of it? The dog is ill. Possibly. But he attacks no one else. 
nor does he molest his master save on very special occasions. Curious, Watson, very curious. Ah, that must be Mr. Bennett, Professor Presbury's assistant. He is before his time. His appointment was 8.30. Come in, come in. Ah, good evening, Mr. Bennett. Good evening. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. I couldn't consider undertaking a case or solving an enigma without his invaluable aid. Oh, really? Pay no attention to Mr. Bennett. He's pulling my leg again. Delighted to meet you, sir. I, I hope you'll forgive me arriving so early, Mr. Holmes, but Edith is so worried about her father, and naturally I... Uh, quite so. Uh, Edith, my dear Watson, is Professor Presbury's daughter, oh, yes. to whom Mr. Bennett is engaged to be married. Am I right? Yes, Mr. Holmes, I have that honor. Oh, congratulations, young man, congratulations. Ideal state, Max. Watson, I... stop chattering. Well, I was only going to say that I've only been... Well, now then, Mr. Bennett, oh, I believe you came at the salient points of the case in your letter, but I've not had the opportunity to relate them to Dr. Watson. So if you will be good enough to go over the matter again... Certainly, Mr. Holmes. The professor, as you may know, Dr. Watson, is a man of splendid reputation. Yes, indeed he is. A trifle positive, I might even say combative, but there has never been a breath of scandal... At least until a month ago. Dear me, you tell me that old Presbury has started to sow his wild oats at his age. <laughs> I always considered him the soul of respectability. Well, you see, early last fall he became attached to the daughter of Professor Morphy. It was not the reason courting of an elderly man, but rather the passionate frenzy of youth. Oh, me. In short, his family considered the infatuation rather excessive. Exactly. And so I gathered that the young lady, although her father, Professor Morphy, favored the match. Mm, yes. Presbury is fairly well to do, I understand. Yes. About a month ago, Professor Presbury did something he's never done before. He left home without telling anyone he was going. A fortnight later, he returned rather travel worn. Oh, had he been? Well, he refused to say. By chance, however, I received a letter from a friend of mine in Prague saying he'd seen the professor at a distance. And now comes the remarkable part of the story. Oh? Yes, Dr. Watson. From that time on, a curious change came over the professor. Those around him had the inexplicable feeling he that he was under some influence that darkened his better nature. Well, you don't think that he was uh, hypnotized, possibly, or, or mentally unbalanced in some way? No, on the contrary. His lectures were more brilliant than ever. His mind was singularly alert. But there was something new about him, something, something sinister. His daughter tried again and again to penetrate the mask he'd put on, but in vain. He behaved to her almost as though she, she were a stranger. In fact, all of his friends and co-workers noticed a, a rather singular change of personality. And the incident of the letters, Mr. Bennett. Don't forget that. I was just coming to that. You see, Dr. Watson, the professor has never had any secrets from me. I handled every paper which came in to him and opened all his letters. Yes, 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 of course, of course. Shortly after his return, all this was changed. Certain letters began to arrive marked with an X under the stamp. These I was in no account to touch. What was the handwriting like? Decidedly illiterate. The envelopes had the E.C. mark. East Central, eh? Yeah? Not exactly the portion of London one would expect the professor to be in touch with. The letters were curious enough, but, but not more curious than the little wooden box. Wooden box? Yes. One of those quaint carved things one associates with a, a visit to Germany. I discovered it one morning in the drawer of Professor Presbury's desk. He had sent me into his study in search of a cannula. <laughs> I put it on my desk, Bennett, in front of the inkwell. It's not here, Professor Presbury. I'll try the drawers. It's usually in the upper right. No, not here. Perhaps the left one. I say, Professor, what a curious box. I've never seen that in here before. What box? This one with the carving. You must have got it on your trip to Germany. What, what trip to Germany? Who said I was in Germany? Professor Pesbury, I... I you mean sniveling little cat. You contemptible snoop. I, I what do you mean by poking about among my things? Put that box down. Well, let me explain. Put that box down, I say. Go. Oh, now get out of here. Get out before I break every bone in your body. <laughs> Jolly chap, the professor. Sounds as if he were heading for an apoplectic fit. Do you remember the date of that outburst, Mr. Bennett? It was December the 2nd. It was on that very day that Roy the Wolfhound made his first attack on the professor. An attack? Do you mean that the dog actually bit him? Well, he certainly tried to. When was the next attack? December the 11th and again on December the 20th. After that, we had to banish Roy to the stables. Singular, most singular. Those dates were new to me. 
there have been some even stranger developments since I wrote you, Mr. Holmes. Yes? What I speak of occurred the night before last. It was really a terrifying experience. Yes, yes, go on. I live with Professor Presbury, as you know, Mr. Holmes. I had retired rather early and was correcting the papers of a lecture I was to deliver in the morning. At 11.30, all was quiet, and I blew out my lamp and went to sleep. A little after midnight, I was uh, awakened by a curious shuffling and muttering in the corridor. It was followed by a series of dull knocks on what I took to be Edith's door. I heard her open the door. There was a gasp, and then she uttered a terrible scream. <laughs> It's all right, darling. I'm coming. What's the matter? Don't look so terrified. Oh, Edward. Edward, it was horrible. Like a nightmare. What was? Oh, well, darling, don't tremble so. I'm here now. Tell me what frightened you. I thought I heard someone knocking at my door. I heard it too. I got up and opened the door. And there it was. Staring up at me. It? What do you mean? Was it a man? I don't know. I only know it was something dark and crouching. I screamed and it hurried down the hall, not quite in its hands and knees, with its face sunk between its shoulders. How awful. You lock yourself in and I'll have a look. No. No, don't leave. But, darling, I... I, I... Shh. Do you hear anything? No. Nothing that... There it is again. In the ivy outside the window. As though someone were climbing up the wall. That's impossible. The wind is a good 20 feet from the ground. Nobody would hear. Look. On the windowsill. A hand. It's... It's drawing itself up. Here comes the head. Good heavens, what a horrible face. The eyes that live. Oh, Edward. Edward. It's father. <laughs> Well, Watson, what do you make of that? The professor crawling about in this curious fashion. Lumbago, probably. I've known it to double a man up. Oh, rubbish, Watson. Did you ever hear of a man with lumbago scaling a 20-foot wall? Oh, now that you mention it, no. Mr. Bennett, how did Professor Presbury explain his actions the next morning? He seemed to have no recollection of them. No recollection of them at all. When did you say this happened, Mr. Bennett? The night before last. The 4th of February, huh? That rather complicates matters. And uh, last night, did anything further happen? The only unusual thing I heard was Roy, barking furiously a, a little after midnight. Poor fellow, he's been chained down to the stable. I, I must confess, if anything else happened, neither Edith nor I would have known it. You see, we both had a feeling of impending danger and slept with our doors locked and the shutters barricaded. Very sensible procedure. I would suggest that you get Miss Presbury out of the house for a few days. Send her away until we can clear this matter up. I've already persuaded her to pay a visit to her aunt in Cambridge. Splendid. Now, as to the dates of these, uh, seizures, you will say the first was December the 2nd, the next December the 11th, and the third... Uh... Here's a list of the dates. When I first observed abnormality in the professor's behavior, I, I felt it my duty to obtain all possible data about the case. Excellent. Let's see. Yes... Yes, as I thought, the intervals are regular. Putting two and two together, let us say that every nine days the professor takes some strong drug, which has a passing but highly poisonous effect. He learned to take this drug while in Prague, and is now supplied by an intermediary who resides in the East Central District of London. Yes, yes, but the dog and the creeping man in the passage. Holmes, the thing's too fantastic to be explained by a simple addiction to drugs. It's not simple, not in the least. But patience, Watson... Patience, we've at least made a beginning. Our next step is to obtain an interview with the professor himself. Uh, what is the best time to catch him in, Mr. Bennett? When would he be free to see us? About 11 in the morning, Mr. Holmes. Good. You may expect us at that time tomorrow. Just a moment, we'll keep our appointment with the professor. But first... Men, remember, if you want your hair to look healthy and handsome, one of the first requisites is a hygienic scalp. And when you buy a hair tonic, be smart. Enjoy the extra advantages of a highly specialized hair tonic like Cremel. Cremel contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why it keeps unruly hair neatly in place longer, with a rich, healthy-looking luster. 
Yet Kremel never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. It never leaves hair feeling sticky or dirty. But men, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kremel is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. A quick massage with Kremel helps stimulate the cutaneous circulation of the scalp. Notice how alive your scalp feels, how it tingles. And if your hair is so dry it breaks off and falls, start using Kremel at once. Because Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling softer, more pliable, makes it look as if it had some body to it. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Dr. Watson, what happened next in the strange case of Professor Presley? Well, early the next morning, found us near the town of Camford, approaching a large, rather gloomy house. This must be the house, Watson. Notice the ivy vines reaching up to the bedroom windows. See? Some of the leaves have been torn away. The vines look decidedly the worse for wear. Oh, surely no man could possibly climb up that way? No normal man, Watson. No normal man. But look... I fancy that is the professor peering at us from behind the curtains in that second window. Doesn't seem to be too well pleased at our presence. Yes, looking chap. Tremendously vigorous for his age. I say, Holmes, do you, do you think we ought? Ought what? Well, I mean, what excuse are you going to give for our call? Assuming that Professor Presbury's memory is a trifle defective during his bad spells, and how is he to know that he didn't send for us himself? Well, isn't that rather skating on thin ice? Possibly, my dear Watson, possibly. I must say... Uh... I don't relish this interview at all. Shh. Someone's coming. It's Presbury himself. For heaven's sake, Watson, put yourself together. You look as though you've been caught stealing sheep. Good morning. Professor Presbury, I believe? Yes. I'm Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Oh, yes, I believe I've heard of you. Won't you come in? This is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Oh, all right. Come this way, gentlemen. To my study. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. What a charming room. Uh, delightful, eh, Holmes? Pray sit down, gentlemen. Now, what can I do for you? Why, that was the question I was about to put to you. To me, sir? Yes. Apropos of the communication you sent me. A letter? I sent you a letter? Uh, no. Not exactly a letter. A telegram, then? Have you got it with you? No, I can't say I have. No, I dare say not. Because I sent you no telegram. Impossible. Why, then, someone's been playing a practical joke on us both. That statement, Mr. Holmes, is highly questionable. Hmm? Really, Professor Presbury, I can only apologize for this needless intrusion and uh, hope that you will forgive me. But that is hardly enough, Mr. Holmes. What kind of fool do you take me for? Why, I... You know I didn't send for you. You can't get out of this so easily. I should, 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 should. tell you, you scoundrel. Oh, Put down that paper, wait, Professor. I should. Consider your position. You can't afford a scandal. After all, <laughs> I'm rather well known. You cannot possibly afford a treatment with such disgust. I think not. Come on, Watson. The interview's closed. Good day, Professor. Phew. What a narrow escape. The Professor was certainly in a dangerous mood. Yes, our learned friend's nerves are somewhat out of order. Highly inflammable temper. Maniacal, I should say. And yet his mind seemed perfectly clear. Too clear. That was my miscalculation. His memory is quite reliable, unfortunately. Strange. Very strange. I must say, Holmes, I'm a bit disappointed in you. All that trouble for nothing. Not quite for nothing. We have seen the gentleman and have gained a personal contact. We have also discovered the address of the intermediary in London. And where will how in thunder... The professor wrote to him this morning. I deciphered the name from the blotting pad on the professor's desk. I say. The gentleman's name is Dorak, and he lives in the commercial road. And now, Watson, I'm a busy man. We will drop this case until next Tuesday evening. Tuesday? But why Tuesday? On that date... If my calculations are correct, the professor should have another of his curious spells. We must be on hand to notice the developments and to prevent a catastrophe. Mr. Holmes, this isn't my idea of the way to spend a pleasant evening. Look at those clouds cutting across the moon. Yes. I told you to bring your greatcoat. I suspected it might be a trifle uh, drafty. Drafty? My legs are quite numb from crouching behind this gooseberry bush. Why did you have to pick this particular night? 
if the cycle of nine days holds good, we shall have the professor at his worst tonight. Moreover, I ascertained that he received a packet from the man Dorak this morning. Yes, we shall see. We shall see. Look, look, look. Someone has lit a light in the corner bedroom. That must be the professor. So I was right in my calculations. Things are beginning to happen. I warned Bennett not to try to interfere with him, but to follow him at a safe distance. Safe? You don't think that he's uh, as dangerous as that, do you? I don't think so. I know it. What? Have you your revolver uh, handy? Well, yes, but you uh, don't think I should be obliged to, to, to use it? Huh? Oh, control your nerves, well, Watson. I can hear your teeth chattering. It's not nerves. It's cold. The professor's symptoms are particularly interesting. Huh? Apart from these fits, he has more energy and vitality than ever. And then... His knuckles. Did you notice his knuckles? No, I can't say that I did. Thick and horny. Quite unusual for a man. Very curious knuckles that can only be explained by the mode of progression observed in... The knuckles. But of course. And the dog. And the ivy. Why didn't I think of that before? Shh. Holmes, Holmes. Look, 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 look. He's opened the side door. There he is. Standing in the doorway. Leaning forward. With his arms dangling. Of course. Of course. Now he's coming down the drive. Wait, he's not walking, he's crouching. Running and skipping along on, on his hands and feet. Holmes, it's uncanny. It's, it's almost as if he were possessed by some strange, unnatural force. There he goes, round the corner of the house. Quick, Watson, we must follow him. Here comes Bennett. Oh, Mr. Holmes, have you seen him? Yes, he went this way. Come along. He's worse than usual tonight. I could hear him through my door, chattering and jabbering to himself. There he is. He's crouching at the foot of the ivy. Now he's climbing. Actually springing from vine to vine. Dressing gown flapping in the wind. How horrible. He looks like some huge bat glued against the side of a house. It's... it's uncanny. Now he's swinging himself over to that tree. He's coming down again. He's heading for the stables. Come along. We mustn't lose sight of him. We can't let him get away from us. The dog has got sight of him. Oh, you kill him if you can get at him. You know, the professor's staying out of reach. Look at him crouched on the ground like that. He's teasing the dog. He's throwing stones at it. Oh, this is inhuman. Quite, Watson, quite. Professor Presbury isn't human. Great heavens, Holmes, what do you mean? Look out. Well, his leash is broken. He's after the professor. He's Come on. He, he's got him by the throat. Drag him apart. Come on, drag him apart. Down, I say. I've got the collar. Watson, help me carry the professor into the house. His throat is badly mangled. Come in, Watson, come in. I've been looking over the professor's laboratory while you were treating his injuries. How is he coming along? As well as can be expected, he'll pull through, I fancy. The wound was dented to near the carotid artery. The hemorrhage is rather serious, but I say, what's that you got in your hand? The Professor's Little German Box. Curious, isn't it? Yes, but it's open. You broke the lock. Really, Holmes, you think that you ought to go... Probably to... not. But not being deterred by your scruples, I've gone ahead. The contents are quite enlightening, if your conscience will permit you to look. Two files, one empty and one nearly full. And a letter with a cross out of the stamp. Yes, that's from our Mr. Dorek, the London intermediary. It contains another note that completely solves the mystery. Here it is. It's signed H. Lowenstein. H. Lowenstein? But I say, that's the Lowenstein. Obviously, Watson, obviously. I mean, it's Dr. Lowenstein, the famous Prague physician, who claims to have discovered a serum that will rejuvenate people. It's been tabooed, of course, by the medical profession, because he refuses to reveal its source. And for a good reason. Here, read the letter. Let's have a look. Honored colleague, since your visit, I have thought much of your case. I beg you report fully to me on the results of my treatment. It is possible that the serum of anthropoid would have been better. I have, as I have explained, used black-faced langur because a specimen was accessible. The langur is, of course, a crawler and a climber, but anthropoid walks erect and is in every way nearer to man. But I say, Holmes, this is beastly. The langur is an ape. Quite. It is found on the slopes of the Himalayas and is the biggest and most human of the climbing monkeys. Then that serum explains the professor's recent peculiarities. He used it in an attempt to regain his youth. Yes. Giving himself a dose at nine-day intervals with the curious results we witnessed. It's dangerous to trick nature, Watson. 
When man tries to rise above it, he is liable to fall below it. Even the highest type of man may revert to the animal if he leaves the straight road of destiny. What a curious story, Dr. Watson. But did Holmes manage to stop the treatment? Indeed. He wrote to Dr. Lowenstein and told him that he would be held criminally responsible if he continued to circulate his poisons. And that was the end of that. Why do you suppose the dog noticed the change in his master before anyone else did? His sense of smell told him. It was the monkey, not the professor, whom Roy attacked. Just as it was the monkey who teased the dog. That's fantastic. I didn't know such things were possible, Dr. White. Oh, dear me, yes. Both in detection and in medicine, things are apt to happen that it is difficult for the lay mind to believe. And between you and Mr. Holmes... Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.